I request Professor Poonam Malhotra Kapoor to please join. And uh, we'll have a time of 13 minutes for the delivery of oration and 2 minutes for the chairman's comments and uh, the conferring of medallion and citation. Ladies and gentlemen, this being an oration, we will not Just have any second. questions from we'll the, the It's over to Dr. H.K. Cho. Yeah, before we start the oration, I'll request Naveen and Poonam to please join me in front. Uh, Krishnam Raju and Kamal Kapoor, please come in front. All the people sitting on the dais should come in front as a token of appreciation to infuse the enthusiasm in the speaker with the medallion so that he can give a better speech and a better talk and a better address. Please uh, come here. Uh, come here, come here. Naveen, yeah, sure. please. Uh, where is Kapoor? KK Kapoor? Yeah, please. And the medallion, this is a very important oration in the name of uh, none other than Professor KK Malhotra. KK Malhotra was father of uh, Puna Malhotra, a very eminent person, a member of CSI and a very dedicated philanthropist of India. This uh, oration is being bestowed upon none other than our own President of American College of Cardiology, Dr. H. K. Reddy. I'll request Poonam uh, to please give a token of uh, scroll. Uh, thank you very much and with this we'll request you to address us on this important prestigious oration. Dr. Malhotra, Dr. Chopra, Dr. Nanda, the respected chairman on the dais, and ladies and gentlemen, it gives me a distinct honor and great privilege to speak uh, in the memory of a great person and supreme soul in the next few minutes. Um, professor Malhotra, Dr. Malhotra, was a professor and head of the Department of Medicine, 1980 to 89, and he was in charge of the nursing home. Nursing home in this country means a big hospital in the uh, USA is different. And also, he was a uh, uh, nursing home in RML Hospital. He was in charge of that. He was a uh, postgraduate from RML Hospital in 1960. He joined the Indian Army to serve the nation during Indo-Pak and Indo-China War. From 64 to 72, he was in charge of medical services at Ladakh Command Hospital. He authored the book, Man at High Alti Altitude, Altitude actually, 1972. He laid the foundation stone for the Department of Medicine, Safdarjang Hospital, the historic hospital, 1973. He was chief of the ICU in the Willingdon Hospital, 79 to 89. He was head of the Department of Medicine, 80 to 89. Started the dialysis center and the coronary care unit in Armin Hospital in 85 to 87. He started a charitable clinic, Ram Memorial Clinic, and a Bal Kalyan Kendra School, Kendra School under the banner of Malhotra Trust. Dr. Malhotra, about him, I spoke to Dr. Nanda, very close friend. I spoke to Kanta Nanda, very, very close friend. She, she actually, he was her teacher. He taught medicine to Kanta Nanda. After talking to his grandson, daughter, and a whole lot of friends, Dr. Malhotra was the kindest, smartest, most charitable, and the wisest individual that existed on this globe. A dedicated national hero. We should give him a give, big hand. <clears throat> He was indeed a great father, exemplary community leader, and a pioneer. His great spirit will live among us forever. He was a supreme, the best, no, most noble spirit, most noble soul, as they call it. In the next few minutes, I just want to tell you about what is going to happen in the future. Next, next 20, 30 years, we're all getting older. Just remember that, we are getting older, but old age is not a disease. It's a, it's a process, but it's not, it's actually, it's a process, but it's not a disease. Uh, basically, it is natural, but you can prevent, you can pre postpone it. And uh, maybe 100 years from now, you're going to make a change in genes so that you live forever. Just be prepared. Don't spend all your money now. Spend one, actually, put one rupee a day behind for your age on more than 100 years of age. But the only thing is, we all want to get old, but we don't want to be disabled. So that's the thing. The most important thing is, we are to do certain things to prevent some old age disease. So the next few minutes I'm going to talk about old age disease, like a stiff neck, stiff knee, we have a stiff heart syndrome, 
So now, as you can see, as you scan the globe, uh, in 2014, you know, that's the older people, oldest people, as you can see in this, uh, you know, the color here, this color here, Canada has the oldest people, and after Australia, the oldest people. I don't know why the size are moving, but then uh, in 2050, the oldest people will be living in Canada, United States, China, uh, and Australia, and uh, other countries, but India will be the youngest. India will be the youngest country for a long time to come. So we'll be serving the whole world. We'll be taking care of the whole globe. So be prepared. Uh, but now, with old age, there's a new syndrome emerging, at least in the United States of America. A lot of my patients are 90 plus, 100 plus. So now they have this accumulated inflammation, uh, you know, uh, over a period of time, and they have unchecked inflammation, degeneration, disuse atrophy and dysfunction. If you don't use your organs, arms, legs, body, mind, you lose it both mentally and physically. So now, but I just want to tell you some, uh, a few facts about old age. Professor Blakemore from England, he's a neurobiologist, he was a former chief of British Medical Research Council. Uh, he, he claims there's a ceiling how long humans can live. He thinks 120 years. At the turn of the century, people live to be 35, 40 years. Right now, in, in 100 years, we are living 70 to 80, 90 years now. Now, next, next 20 years, you'll see 120 year people coming to the diet and giving a speech. Okay, don't be surprised. Don't, I don't want you to be surprised. Uh, Dr. Blakemore thinks 120 years is the limit, and it's going to happen very soon. And, uh, it, but uh, then his statement was contradicted by researchers in the Aging Institute in California. They think that scientific breakthrough, breakthroughs that are coming along will uh, dramatically prolong life by four to five fold. And this could eventually lead people to live 500 years. Are you prepared for that 500 years? But don't you worry. This is not, we have many, the big universe, a lot of, uh, you know, satellites, a lot of uh, planets, a lot of uh, galaxies, so we can uh, actually colonize other galaxies, or we can colonize asteroids, so no problem, there's plenty of space. Uh, then, by tweaking the genes, you know, CRISPR technology, CRISPR technology, developed, being developed in California and uh, England, they are tweaking uh, the genes, so they, you know, shortening the, they're changing the, uh, you know, the uh, uh, chromosomes. Uh, so by doing that, people are going to live longer. So now, number of people living more than 100 years had increased by 71% in the last 10 years alone. It shot up more than five-fold since the 80s. There are now more, more than half a million people living 90 years higher in the UK alone. Nearly 14,000 people are more than 100 years of age, compared to just 2,500 in 1980. So uh, you can see it's increasing. 2014 Global, Watch, Global Age Watch Index, uh, which ranks 96 nations in the quality of life for the elderly, recently stated that by 2050, the number of people over 60 will be 21% of the global population. You saw the map. The oldest people not, won't be in this country, don't you worry, but in other countries. So that will double, the double, this figure will double to 12%. So this is an 80, 80 that I just want to give an example. But living, old, living longer is not a problem. It's not an issue. It's a good thing. Living life is good. Death is bad. So, but now, we, we get some diseases. So I just want to give you some examples of what diseases you can get in the heart, since I'm a cardiologist. So-called stiff heart syndrome, diastolic heart failure. For, the, for that, you no know, treatment. It can be prevented. So I give an example of an 85-year-old gentleman lady with a history of obesity, hypertension, and recent onset atrial fibrillation. This is a syndrome, it's a combination. They're usually obese, they have hypertension, they have new onset atrial fibrillation, and they have so-called diastolic heart failure. The heart function is normal with a stiff heart. For them, you give a diuretics to relieve the congestion. They feel tired. Their kidney function gets worse. B1 goes up, creatinine goes, gets, gets worse. And then they have a, they will develop atrial fibrillation. Now you have to give drugs to control the heart rate. It's kind of a, not a good thing to have this disease. It can be prevented. So this is an echo of this, general, uh, this lady. So you can see left ventricle is contracting normally. And then, of course, left atrium is a little large. There's the LVH. And uh, the left atria, or quite big, both left atrium and right atrium, and they're quite big, even though left ventricle function is normal, but it's stiff, that's why atria are big. And then, of course, the, 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 you know, it, the uh, Doppler flow indicates the patient has diastolic dysfunction. So you can see that the atria, sometimes both the atria are bigger than the ventricles. And you see this 90, 100-year-old people, their heart is functioning normally, the ventricles are smaller than the atria. So this is a typical picture of a diastolic dysfunction. And then I'll give an, another example, a 92-year-old man, with a history of long-standing hypertension and a sedentary lifestyle. For the last six months, he, sorry, 
He had dyspnea, fatigue, and palpitations on leg edema. Physical exam only remarkable for high blood pressure, 160 over 90, and leg edema, one plus leg edema. Now, uh, his echo, you can see, there's only mild LV cystoid dysfunction, maybe mild to moderate. But look at the left atrium, it's quite big. And this gentleman has uh, right ventricular enlargement to both atria enlarged. He has a pulmonary hypertension, this all goes together. They have diastolic dysfunction, they have pulmonary hypertension, and they develop atrial fibrillation, which is a bad combination. You can see now, as we already, many speakers have gone over this in the last couple of days, obesity, these people have a, pro, uh, you know, phenotype. That means they have a typical profile. They're usually obese, they're old, they're, they have diabetes due to insulin resistance, they have inflammation, oxidative stress we talked about, so-called vascular endothelial dysfunction, Dr. Sainan talked about it. They have a lower nitric oxide, high endothelium, and they develop uh, uh, diastolic heart failure, pulmonary hypertension, atrial fibrillation. So this syndrome, diastolic heart failure with pulmonary hypertension, atrial fibrillation, in the elderly has been increasing. Now close to 50%, half the patients with heart failure have diastolic heart failure. That's quite a, quite a number. So they typical, have, typically have hypertension, pre-renal azotemia, renal insufficiency, atrial fibrillation, pulmonary hypertension, and they are coexisting with these patients. So they're usually overweight, they have a fatigue, they have dyspnea, they have leg edema, right? So the, some of the histological sam, you know, analysis of these cardiac chambers have shown that they have a cardiac muscle hypertrophy, they have a interstitial collagen deposition in the, between the muscle cells leading to the decreased elasticity, elastic, uh, increased stiffness. So it's like as if your knees are stiff, you know, your neck is stiff, you can't move it, right? Heart gets stiff too, so we have to exercise that. Many of our experts already alluded to, exercise is extremely important. So the risk factors for the diastolic heart failure in the elderly are typically, of course, I, don't, I hate to say age. Age is not a disease, it's a process. Age doesn't have to be a risk factor, but they need old, usually old. They have systolic hypertension, they have diabetes, renal insufficiency, they have a normal EF on the echocardiogram, and they have LVH, uh, then they have exercise intolerance, right? So basically, uh, they have increased arterial stiffness, myocardial stiffness, and they have impaired adrenergic responsiveness, impaired vascular function, the endothelial dysfunction, sinus node dysfunction, they develop uh, bradycardia, atrial fibrillation, and they have a decreased cardiovascular reserve. So this is a kind of, I apologize for the slide, but uh, basically, we'll go next slide. So they have a, but as you can, you can imagine, you can, you can Ex, uh, guess, you can diagnose preclinical diastolic dysfunction before it even happens, before it happens. So they usually have a hypertension, which is not controlled well, they have little leg edema, the preserved ejection fraction. So these pa patients need to be profiled and we need to prescribe exercise and low weight loss, all those risk factor modification, yoga, etc., to prevent diastolic heart failure. Um, optimal blood pressure control is extremely important in these patients and diuretics might be needed, of course, to, compare, to prevent uh, hypertension, to treat hypertension. And amlodipine, as lisinopril, doxazosin, which all, we all give them anyway. All those medications regress, LV hypertrophy, improve LV diastolic dysfunction, and of course, uh, uh, if you profile all the medications, you know, if you see the influence of medications on the diastolic dysfunction, it goes like this. Your angiotensin II receptor blockers decrease diastolic dysfunction by 13%, calcium channel blockers decrease by 11%, and the ACE inhibitors by 10%, diuretics also decrease by de uh, controlling blood pressure, and beta blockers by 10 6%. So, uh, now, as you know, we all prescribe these medications. ARP is calcium channel blockers. ACE inhibitors appear to mediate higher LVH regression, a beta block, uh, and also beta blockers. A beta blockers, the uh, only thing is the LVH regression may not prevent this disease, but it will help definitely. So, uh, as you know, caloric restriction, aerobic exercise, we already talked about it many times, improve oxygen consumption, peak oxygen consumption, and also improve heart failure due to diastole. So, uh, in a, the randomized control trials, uh, we have shown that con giving optimal medical therapy and exercise will prevent this heart failure. But the other problem in these patients is two-thirds of these patients with so-called heart failure preserved ejection fraction suffer from atrial fibrillation, which causes morbidity and mortality, and they have, uh, they're dependent, they're uh, cardiac output is dependent on atrial kick, and that's last, so you, yeah, diastolic heart failure gets worse. So we need to control the heart rate and try to restore the science rhythm. If it's not possible, sometimes we may have to subject them to ablation, atrial fibrillation ablation. So, towards, this is the one of the last slides here. 
in conclusions, world's population is aging. This is inevitable. So is heart. Among ob obese older patients with a clinically stable so-called heart failure reserve with eject ejection fraction, we have to restrict calories e and prescribe aerobic exercise, which will increase peak weight, VO2, and exercise intolerance, right? People living longer, they develop a diastolic heart failure, they develop uh, atrial fibrillation, and they might need pacemaker sublation, and uh, uh, basically, uh, we have to maintain that. The only thing is, I, just coming to exercise, I just want to make in the last uh, one or two minutes, so I make comments. Exercise simply doesn't mean walking alone. Walking is good. Walking is better than sitting down, but, but standing is better than sitting. Exercise simply means there are three types of exercise. Okay, one is isotonic, which is to increase heart rate by 20 to 30 percent. And your heart rate should be maintained at 110 to 120 for 20 minutes continuously. That's to have the effect, desired effect. That's extremely important. That has to be monitored. We have a variables here, your watches, uh, Fitbit, and all kinds of variables. So you can, that's it, uh, three times a week, four times a week, and uh, uh, our experts have said five times a week, but three, four times a week for sure, that's isotonic. That's not, that's good for the heart and lungs and so-called conditioning, but what about the other two types of exercise? Two, uh, the other two are isometric. You need to maintain your strength, mainly women. You need to actually exercise uh, for your muscles, you know, biceps, triceps, you know, all chest muscles, your leg muscles, your knee muscles, uh, tendons. We need to do so-called resistive exercise. Or if you want to do dancing, Shiva Tandama, or you want to do whatever in dance you want to do, Krishna dance or Shiva Tandama, or whatever you want, that's okay, good. That's also good. But most important thing is some kind of resistive exercises, you know, lifting weights with uh, uh, different types of pulleys or springs. That's extremely important. I see people getting old. One of the things I see is atrophy of the muscles. And they, you know, the uh, stomach is increasing and muscles are decreasing. So you need to maintain that. It's extremely important. So important I can't emphasize enough. People don't do that often. The third one is also more important than you to you do very well, yoga. The flexibility exercises, flexibility meaning moving the muscles in all, uh, neck muscles, uh, arms, legs, in all directions possible every day because otherwise you become stiff and you see old people walking like this. You don't want that. You, you don't mind getting older but you don't want to be a nursing home. You don't want to be dependent on your family. That's most, uh, I should say, fear, uh, uh, I should say, uh, anxiety provoking. Uh, so that's, uh, people are afraid of depending on other people, but they don't mind die, dying, but you don't want to be dependent. So these three types of exercise are extremely important in addition to yoga. Yoga is good for breathing and flexibility, but I just want to tell you, make sure that by doing these three types of exercises on a regular basis to optimal levels, you can prevent the old age disease and you will live longer by 20 years, 20, 30 years. Sure. And your stem cells will get uh, stimulated. That's what happens. But thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you very much. Yes, sir. You'd like to have some comment? Uh, with Chairman permission, your voice is not good. Absolutely, there is one question to you. Uh, what about phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitor, sealed enough, and pulmonary hypertension? Uh, phosphodiesterase inhibitors? In the sealed enough hill. Oh, yeah. So called uh, Viagra. That's excellent. Actually, uh, thank you for asking that question. For, uh, you know, uh, Professor Sainani or Dr. Manchanda, Professor Manchanda has already I've gone over the slides. You know that we have endothelial and vasoconstrictors, we have vasodilators. So we have a nitric oxide, you know, inside our blood vessels, which is a part of our body. As we get older and your hormones uh, fade away, we lose the nitric oxide. So then that also is responsible for diastolic dysfunction, also is responsible for pulmonary hypertension. That's why the professor is alluding to. So I think uh, silenafil is that uh, the Indians use it first in the world. I think I think silenafil is excellent. It's, it's a supplement. It's like it's a blood pressure medicine. It's a blood pressure medication. It has to be used. I like it very much. But but exercising also, you can increase your nitric oxide levels. So I think the message is very clear. The Dr. H K Reddy has given a very nice message that the vascular stiffness, LV stiffness, LA stiffness increase as the age advances. And that's how the diastolic heart failure is very high. And he also mentions that we must try all the maneuvers to reduce the stiffness. And our objective is the stiffness to be reduced to such an extent that we should not produce atrial fibrillation in two-thirds of the patient, which he documented in his slide. So common in elderly, And that's the main cause of stroke. So I think it's a very, very important message. Uh, let's give a big hand to Dr. Thank H.K. You. Reddy Thank you very much. for his outstanding yes, presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, last comment by Dr. Navin. Make one comment. I think, uh, you know, spironolactone is oh, coming yeah. back into the reckoning because uh, 
they first they found there was no effect, but then they found errors in the analysis of the trial. Uh, I was part of the trial actually, and uh, and so now spinal electron is coming back as uh, one of the treatment options for. Uh, Achoo, thank you, uh, th thank you, Professor Nanda. That's an excellent. Uh, thank you. I actually omitted that. I, spinal electron is the best. Is the best actually. My my mentor, Dr. Carl Weber, promoted that quite. We used to laugh, but now That's I think it's no laughing matter. Spinal electron is also inexpensive. It's an old drug with a new application. And Dr. Nanda is extremely, extremely right. I'm sure most of you already prescribed spironolactone. Indian physicians are very smart. So they are, so I think spironolactone is extremely important. Poonam, Poonam is a comment. I want to thank Dr. Reddy uh, for an excellent lecture on a very nice topic, which I'm sure if he was alive, he would have liked to listen more because he was a believer of exercise. Thank you from the heart. And thank Dr. Nanda and Dr. Chopra also for starting and maintaining this oration. Thank you all. Thank you very much, Professor Reddy.